Good evening, you're watching SG News. I'm Hugh Richards. In the headlines tonight, schools across the region receive hoax bomb threats, a new heritage project in Lincoln and a royal visit to Louth. Later in tonight's programme, Jack brings us the post-match thoughts of Grimsby manager Michael Jolly after Saturday's derby against Lincoln. And I'll be talking to Andrew Chandler on his Zero to Zero World Photography Exhibition. A number of schools across East Yorkshire and northern Lincolnshire suffered fake bomb threats this morning. The schools received emails claiming devices had been planted and demanding cash. Humberside Police received 19 reports of threatening emails. The force says it has been liaising with counter-terrorism colleagues and it's not believed the threats are credible. A four-year heritage project will provide historical skills training in Lincoln. The Heritage Lottery Fund has awarded £585,000 to the Historic Environment Skills Project for bursaries for trainees in a range of skills needed for the preservation and presentation of historical artefacts. Working with Lincolnshire County Council's Heritage Skills Centre, it will provide 21 bursaries over the next four years in archaeology and managing a building conservation project. The project also aims to attract thousands of people to outreach events. Louth had a royal visit today. Prince Charles visited Louth Livestock Market to launch the Farm Resilience Programme in Lincolnshire. The programme was set up in 2016 by the Prince's Countryside Fund to help small farms improve their work and equip them with the tools they need to decide their futures. So far, it's helped more than 300 small farms across the UK and it'll run until 2021. During today's visit, the Prince said he was pleased to have been involved in saving the market from closure last year. It is the last surviving livestock market in Lincolnshire. Claire Saunders, the director of the Prince's Countryside Fund, says the programme will enable farmers to adapt to changes in the industry. The main thing from our point of view is that it is a time of change that people need help and support to cope with as you know the support mechanisms change. Um, there is going to be a really strong emphasis on environmental matters and you know everybody needs support to understand how those changes will impact on their business. And one of the joys of the Farm Resilience Programme is that it's quite a flexible uh, model I suppose. So as we learn a bit more about what's going to happen we can feed that into the programme and make sure that people are properly supported to take their businesses forward. It's fantastic. I mean, it's great that he's coming to the auction mart. Uh, he's really been, um, you know, fantastic in helping us to, you know, look at what we, we need to do to support farmers. He's very, very close to the countryside. He's very, very um, knowledgeable about all matters relating to the countryside. So it's great to have him on board. Um, and I'm sure he'll really enjoy his visit here today. First of all, he's recognised Louth as a place to come. And we're delighted that he's chosen Louth to be able to launch his uh, farm resilience program and we're looking forward to what that's going to mean to the community around here because going back to what we were talking about just now anything that's going to help farms farmers be more resilient for our agricultural community to be more resilient and for our industry to be more resilient it's got to be good news the part of everything else i understand only too well how important these sorts of livestock markets are to helping to maintain the rural community, the farming community, and, and the whole life of an important part of the world like this. So um, I do hope that the, that the livestock market now has a uh, durable and sustainable future. And I've much enjoyed having a chance this morning of meeting some of you, hearing something about the fact that Lincoln Reds are beginning to make a real revival not just here, but in other parts of the country. Uh, and the fact that, from what I gather, the prices at the moment haven't been too bad. So at least that's something. I hope, I hope we can make the most of it. So I am enormously grateful to all those who have combined to help save this livestock market. And I can only wish you all every possible success in the future. Hull's Jubilee Church has been broken into. Intruders stormed the building on King Edward Street between 9.30pm on Friday and 9.30am on Saturday. They caused internal damage and stole property from the church. 
Helminster officially reopened today following a £4.5 million restoration. Phase two of the re refurbishment is now complete. The main doors have been closed to the public for more than two years during restoration work. Changes include a new chapel in the North Choir Isle, which features an ornate communion table unused since the 1840s, and state-of-the-art lighting and audio-visual facilities to make the Minster suitable for events and performances. The changes will also allow the venue to work with some of the most isolated and vulnerable members of the community. Uh, it, it's a wonderful feeling. Uh, we've been working at this particular project for five years. Uh, we've had a vision uh, throughout that time. Uh, we've had a fair number of obstacles uh, on the way, um, but we've never varied from that vision, and that vision has been proven by what we see today. It's been a long, hard um, journey, but a worthwhile journey, and people have stuck with us through it all, which is great. We, we have got all the benefits now. We've got the old and the new together. We've still got our wonderful pews in the building, but we've also got the modern underfloor heating, the modern facilities so that groups can come in who need special facilities. So it's taken us into the 21st century in a big way. So I think we reach out to all ages, and I think this is one of the good things here. In our worship, we go right across the board from traditional to very contemporary. And in the projects that we do, we can have a banquet one week with a grand splendour. And then the following week, we can have a group of homeless people in who have very little and we can give them food and drink. So we want to reach out to every person. And I think we are beginning to achieve that. We've got a long way to go. Uh, this church was refitted by the Torians with some very fine pews throughout the nave, um, which was right for the time, but it constricted the use of this church uh, to religious affairs and incidentally um, it, it made it fairly impersonal even for worship. The barriers of, uh, of the fixed pews divided up the audience, the, the, the congregation uh, from the ministry um, uh, in a quite a divisive, quite a divisive way. Um, the church was originally built by the community for the community and that was largely lost through that previous arrangement. Mm. So it was entirely appropriate, appropriate for the 21st century to bring it back into the vision of its founders and to create a building that was right for all of the, commu the community of this great city. And a new campaign has been launched in Hull today in a crackdown on illegal tobacco. Over the last three years, more than 375,000 counterfeit and foreign labelled cigarettes and 101 kilograms of tobacco have been seized by the local authority. That's the equivalent weight of a large baby elephant, apparently. It's resulted in 31 prosecutions and 12 warning notices being issued. The council says the tobacco has proven links to organised crime and is an easy source of supply for children. This is our Keep It Out campaign. We're trying to raise public awareness about the uh, impact of illegal tobacco sales in Hull. About 10% of all sales of tobacco are illegal and it's not a victimless crime. When uh, people are selling illegal tobacco, they, there's often criminal activity, criminal gangs behind that. These are people who are in our streets, living in our, in our streets. We want to keep that out. We know as well that although children and young people are less likely to start smoking now than they ever were, about 50% of them will start smoking because of these illegal sales. But having worked with trading standards here um, in, in the city uh, for a number of years now, I can tell you that illegal tobacco um, is a problem. It's a problem for the, for the community. Um, trading standards are very proactive here. They're out uh, tackling uh, illegal tobacco uh, on, a, on a weekly basis. And as and when they call myself in with uh, tobacco detection dogs to help them locate uh, illegal tobacco products that are hidden uh, in, in some of the shops that are visited. These people aren't bothered about selling tobacco to children and young people under 18. None of us want our children and young people to start smoking. And this uh, illegal sales of tobacco is, is, is preventing that. And finally, people are trying, when people are trying to give up, cheap cigarettes on the streets doesn't help. And we want people to be supported to, for their quit attempts. Because as you say, 
Tobacco causes harm. Over 40 people every month die as a result of, directly as a result of smoking. That's, that's preventable. We're doing lots already to try and ensure that our children and young people grow up in a smoke-free hole. And these criminals are preventing us to doing that. The chair of the Humberside Police Federation says a Hull woman acted foolishly by taking prescription drugs to Egypt. Peter Musgrave, talking about Laura Plummer, she was talking about Laura Plummer, she's currently serving a three-year sentence in the country after taking nearly 300 painkillers to Egypt, she says, for her partner last year. I think there's probably a number of ways. I think um, you've probably got the use of what you call the dark web, um, where you can you know, go underneath what's on the, the content normally and, and, and source all sorts of um, anything you want drug-wise, um, prescription or otherwise. So that's one avenue. Uh, she could have been stockpiling them from, for her own benefit, I don't know. Um, but I would, I would guess that one thing, she was naive uh, in what she did in the sense of no way, if you're going to a place outside of the UK, know what their, their rules are on drugs, I would guess. And you can see that interview in full as part of Hot Topic tonight at 8.30 on S3 TV. Now, join me after the break and I'll be joined by Andrew Chanda to talk about uh, his ex photography exhibition and we'll have all the usual football managers. See you in a few minutes. Welcome back. You're watching S3 News. Still to come tonight, Jack brings us the post-match thoughts of Grimsby manager Michael Jolly after Saturday's derby against Lincoln. And Andrew Chandler tells me about his Zero to Zero photography exhibition. Heavy snowfall forced the Lincoln 10K to be postponed yesterday. Junior and mini races ran on Saturday in bitterly cold temperatures and snow showers, but weather conditions deteriorated overnight and it was deemed unsafe for the main event. The decision was taken following advice from safety professionals and City of Lincoln Council. Organisers have promised participants that the race will go ahead at a later date. Meanwhile, Lincolnshire police say they've dealt with a number of incidents over the weekend as a result of the bad weather. Two HGVs were struck, were stuck on the A17 and officers had to help farmers whose vehicles were stranded. Beverly has been ranked as one of the best places to live in the UK. The poll was put together by the Sunday Times for their best place to live in 2018 study. It looked at factors such as jobs, schools and local shops. York came out on top due to what the newspaper said was its perfect mix of heritage and high tech. It was described by the paper as a mini metropolis. North Lincolnshire Council wants to build a new dementia unit in Scunthorpe. It proposes 25 new two-bed apartments at the intermediate care home on Warwick Road to enable dementia sufferers to live independently with the support they need. The £4.5 million investment would be the first dementia-friendly housing scheme in North Lincolnshire. Plans are expected to be submitted by the end of March. Students at Ron Deering University Technical College are embarking on a new joint endeavour with Smith & Nephew. The company has set a project for students linked to its new unique device identification programme, an important process in the labelling of medical products. The prototype of the equipment has been donated to the UTC by Smith & Nephew and Year 12 students are now tasked with putting a maintenance plan together to ensure the smooth running of operations. Libraries across North East Lincolnshire will have revised opening times from next month. The move comes after a consultation last year of nearly 800 people. The borough's four core libraries, Grimsby, Cleethorpes, Immingham and Waltham, are affected and the changes come into effect on the 1st of April. The new hours can be found on North East Lincolnshire Council's website. Recycling officers from East Riding Council have been in Bridlington today as part of a spring clean campaign. The team has been advising people where to take their rubbish instead of putting it in household bins which can't be recycled. These items include broken garden furniture, old paint pots and brushes and rubble and bricks. Officers will be in Withensea tomorrow at the Customer Service Centre between 10am and 12.30pm and at Driffield Market on Thursday from 9am. 
An additional sporting memories session starts this week due to popular demand. The session, run by Lynx Inspire, aims to connect sports fans from across the area, giving people the opportunity to remember their own personal sports memories or the achievements of local people and teams. They aim to combat social isolation. Alan Shearer recently attended one of the groups as part of a BBC documentary, Dementia, Football and Me. The additional group takes place on Wednesday at Waltham Library from 3.30. Now, a new exhibition opens later this month featuring photographs from around the world taken by an intrepid explorer. And he joins me now, Andrew Chandler. Thank you very much for, for coming in, Andrew. First of all, the exhibition is called Zero to Zero. What's that in reference to? Well, the fact that I wanted to say that I'd travelled right the way around the world, so I actually started off uh, in Greenwich at the Royal Observatory. Zero degrees the, longitude. The prime meridian. Um, and the idea was to spend the next four months then travelling right the way around the world uh, back to Greenwich. The, you, you took your camera with you, and I take it you're a, you're a prolific photographer. Uh, yes, well, I do it as a profession, um, but I've got a real passion for travel photography. Um, so the idea was to um, set myself the challenge of visiting as many countries as I could uh, in that four-month period. Um, and um, I um, embarked upon that trip with my, with my brother, and the idea was to tick off a number of places on my bucket list. Well, before we go through the itinerary, let's just get the details out of where people can see these photographs. It'll be at the uh, Village Hall in Skidby in East Yorkshire, and uh, it starts on Good Friday. So that's a week on Friday, um, and it's uh, a four-day exhibition, so it finishes on the bank holiday Monday. Where did he go? Well, I started in India, flew to Delhi, and explored what's called the Golden Triangle. Um, and after India, uh, got a flight to um, Bangkok, to, to Thailand, explored something of Thailand, and then travelled north into Laos, uh, travelled down the Mekong River through Laos, uh, into Vietnam, uh, Cambodia, Malaysia, Indonesia. Uh, you, you didn't cut any corners then, did you? you no, were, not at all. No, uh, we did have a bit of a rest in, in, in Bali. Yeah, that's uh, a nice place a to have a rest. Yeah. That's, that's right. And then, he then headed for Australia after that. And then from Australia, home by, by, con by continuously travelling east? Yes. I mean, I discovered when I started looking into the trip that um, if you keep going east, if you get a round the world ticket, it's quite an effective, cost effective way of actually doing the trip. Uh, so from uh, from New Zealand uh, across the international date line, uh, you get to Los, An Los Angeles and then explore something of America and finished off in Iceland. Uh, and then back to the Zero Meridian again? Back to the Meridian, to, that's right. To, to finish your trip, which yes. runs not very far from this, uh, uh, from this studio. Um, one overriding memory of the whole thing? Oh, it's so difficult because there, there are so many different cultures, so many different places to visit. But I was, I was blown away by Ayers Rock, which I was not expecting to be because obviously we've all seen pictures of Ayers Rock. Uh, but that was fantastic. People of Laos, marvellous. Um, saw some wonderful scenery and some wonderful wildlife. And the southern states uh, of America, Utah, Monument Valley, quite spectacular. I know, I've been there. Thank you very much, Andrew, for coming. Look forward to seeing some of those pictures. Thank you. Here's Jack with all the sports. We'll start with football and it was a disappointing derby day for Grimsby Town in League Two on Saturday. The Mariners went down 3-1 to their county rivals Lincoln City at a sold-out Sinsel Bank to further deepen the threat of relegation. Goals from Leif Recklington, Matt Green and Scott Wharton saw the home side fly into a 3-0 lead. A Ben Davies penalty on the stroke of half-time gave Town a glimpse of hope, but in reality they never looked like staging a comeback. Michael Jolly's first away game as manager was one to forget, with Lincoln scoring their three goals in the space of just eight minutes to kill off any Grimsby hopes by half-time. Michael Jolly spoke to me after the game and I asked him whether he was disappointed with his players' performance. Absolutely, there's no escaping the fact that you know a local derby um, we're disappointed with the outcome. Uh, I thought we actually started the game reasonably well. We had the first big chance when we hit the, uh, the bar and the post. And I think had we taken that, maybe it would have had a different feel. But clearly there was a, a crazy kind of eight, ten minute period where um, they took the game away from us. And, and uh, you know, it was, um, it was extremely disappointing because we knew the type of threat they would pose and we didn't deal with it. So I'm not going to stand here and say I'm happy about that. I'm not. 
Uh, that said, you know, we, we, um, we still had a long time left in the game and I, I think we tried to get back in the game. Obviously, we got, we got the one. Had we got a second goal in the second half, we could have built more momentum. But, of course, uh, it's a disappointing day. A town are just six points above the relegation zone, but Chesterfield below them have two games in hand. Moving on to the Championship, and it was an equally bad weekend for Hull City. The Tigers were thrashed 3-0 at fellow relegation strugglers Birmingham City, who registered a comfortable victory at St Andrews. A double from Spanish midfielder Jota was added to by Che Adams, as Hull put in a poor display in snowy conditions down in the West Midlands. It's a result which leaves City now just six points above Birmingham, who currently occupy the final relegation spot. And in League One, it was another painful defeat for one of our local sides. Another of our local sides, Scunthorpe United, lost 2-1 to second place Shrewsbury Town at Glanford Park on Saturday. The Iron had taken the lead through a looping Josh Morris free kick after just eight minutes. Morris then had the perfect chance to make it 2-0 after Ivan Tony was fouled in the box, but he saw his weak penalty saved. That miss came back to haunt him as John Nolan's strike and a Josh Payne penalty gave the visitors a comeback win. Scunthorpe stay in fifth place, both, but both teams below them have games in hand. And finally, in Rugby League, Hull FC lost to Salford Red Devils in the Super League on Friday night. The Black and Whites went down by 24 points to eight in what was a disappointing performance by Lee Radford's men. Dean Hadley scored Hull's only try, while Max Sneed registered two kicks, but Salford were just too strong for FC on the night. That result leaves Hull in ninth place in the table, having lost four of their opening six Super League games so far. And that's all for today's sport. Back to you in the studio. Thanks very much, Jack. That's all for tonight. If you have a news story for us or any other reason to contact us, please do. We'd love it. Facebook or Twitter appear below me. Email news at estuary.tv or phone Grimsby 01472311553 or write to us, Estuary TV, Nuns Corner, North East Lincolnshire, DN345BQ. Good evening. Thank you.